The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone, welcome to the STOA, session three of the Unsuccess Symposium. Let us get successful so we don't have to give a shit or we can stop giving a shit about getting successful. Uh, it's a mouthful, that event. And um, today we have um, Tom, or this session we have uh, Tom Butler Bowden, uh, author of 50 Success Classics, amongst many other in the series. Uh, I read that book a, a while ago. I, I quite liked it. And uh, Tom reached out to me actually because that was he saw me on the the Stoicon thing, um, and then I invited him on uh, uh, for today. Uh, and so I'm going to take in. We got a new MC. Um, I haven't figured out what his title is at the Stoa, but like success artist or something. We're gonna we're gonna create something jazzy. But Shahir. So I'm going to take in Shahir. And if Shahir, if you can introduce Tom and, and set the protocols for today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Pete. I do appreciate it. Hey guys, my name is Shahir Shahid. I'm actually, this is actually the first time me actually being on the STOA. So it's a pleasure being here, guys. Uh, I'm super excited to announce our first guest, which is Tom Butler Bowden. He is a author from the UK, well known for his 50 success series of books, ranging from philosophy to psychology uh, and personal development in general. But before I introduce Tom, I want to just set the protocol straight. So if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat below and I'll call your name. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. If you're, if you don't want to be on YouTube, that's completely fine. Just feel free to indicate that down below. I'll be more than happy to read out your question out loud, but without any further ado, welcome to the Stoa, Tom. Oh, you're on mute, Tom. Yeah. Thank you so much, Peter and Shahir. Great to be with you. Um, yeah, fantastic opportunity to talk on this subject. Um, I don't think, I mean, if you think of the people in the world who are considered, uh, who think about success as their job, uh, you tend to only think about sort of motivational gurus and sports trainers and stuff. Um, but I came at it from a different perspective, which is I analyzed and wrote about um, the classic books in motivational genre, uh, self-help, spirituality, because I wanted to get a handle on um, everything that had sort of been said in the sphere of, of success, personal success. Um, so uh, that I had a sort of personal, I guess, reasons to discover all that for myself, the best tips, strategies, hacks, et cetera. But as I got further into it, I got more interested in the larger question of what is success? Um, and, you know, who judges it? When can it be judged? Um, and I was always very interested in, in what other people said about what they considered was success. What I thought was success was not necessarily what other people thought was. And also older people I noticed tend to have a slightly different view of success than someone who was like 18 or 20. Um, so I wasn't really satisfied with the traditional definitions of success. So things like the accomplishment of goals, uh, health, wealth, and happiness, or the fulfillment of potential. All those, all those definitions sort of, they're okay and they make sense. Um, but I was more interested, I, I wondered if success could actually ever become a discipline in itself, you know, like psychology or philosophy. And I thought if that was ever going to happen, um, you had to go back to the first principles and take a more philosophical view of what success is. Um, so people relied on methods to achieve what they want, um, but often they wonder why they're not really getting anywhere. You've always, all, all probably have friends who have read all the self-help books, motivational books, but they don't seem very super successful <laughs> or happy. You know, it's the old thing about that, that finance book, where are the customers' yachts? So if the advisors are so successful, um, you know, uh, where, where are all their, their clients? Why aren't they successful too and rich? So 
I, I wanted to go back to, I thought there was a need for, for principles first and then methods second um, in the whole success area. And when I started to think about what success really, what is it? Um, one thinker that came to mind was Robert M. Persick. He wrote the classic book in the 70s, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It took me a while to wrap my head around this book because it was all about this elusive concept called quality. I thought, what the hell is he going on about quality? And as it goes on, you know, it's like a road trip on his motorcycle. And he, and he sort of thinks about it on the way driving across America. And you start to while, after a while get the understanding that quality is something done for its own sake. You know, just because you want it done right or it should be done right. So like, you know, the great, a great furniture maker, um, the back of the cabinet is as beautiful as the front, the inside of the, of the drawers. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs, the famous thing of it, the inside of the computers and, and the iPhone had to be beautiful and beautifully ordered, not just the outside. Um, so started to develop this idea of um, quality. Um, and then that led me to the idea of truth. So the realization that success is never wealth, power, fame on its own. Um, it's not even necessarily happiness or well-being. All these things uh, are important and they sort of overlap. But what success really is, is truth or quality. Um, so truth being something that is inextricably bound up with time. So something or someone can be successful or appear successful for a short period, depending on how you measure the, the time frame. But time always is a way of weighing success um, so that uh, over time, like someone like Van Gogh, who was not appreciated in his own lifetime, you know, after his death becomes more and more successful. Uh, so time itself is the judge of truth and quality. Um, it's never other people, it's not even society as a whole in the time frame that the person or the idea is around. So time is this weighing machine and time is a judge of success. Um, so in my work, obviously I've studied a lot of people like Tony Robbins, you know, the, the weekend seminars with going over the hot coals and people having this big sort of epiphany moment where they think their life is changed. But, you know, two weeks, three weeks after the seminar, they go sort of sink back to their normal life. Um, so that, that makes you appreciate that success is something that happens over months, years, decades. For me, that time was the real missing link in the understanding of success. Um, there's the old saying, people attribute it to Bill Gates, but actually it was before him, people overestimate what they achieve in a year and underestimate what they can achieve in a decade. So that sort of says it all. Um, and just a sort of example to try and illustrate um, this, the, the sort of truth and fallacy of success. So if you look at Adolf Hitler and Nelson Mandela, um, Hitler was incredibly successful. He went from being an outcast student in Vienna to dominating the most powerful country in Europe. But of course, over time, that apparent truth was all revealed to be lies. And the longer that time went on, the worst impact on the rest of the world that he had. And look at Mandela, it was the opposite. The longer he lived, the greater he became. So his truth was revealed slowly over time. Um, and it's not just people, it's obviously ideas as well. I mean, for, for over a century, communism was the hot idea. Um, it was a very successful idea, it spread around the world. Um, but time revealed it to be uh, not so beneficial. Um, so trying to get it to this definition of success being truth, um, I, I see it as whether an idea or a person or an institution or a work of art or an object embodies something lasting and positive. Um, so will it have a good impact now, but will that impact increase over time? Um, 
and I just want to, okay, that's a very high level philosophy of success, but then for you and me, uh, maybe you're thinking, well, you know, what are the paths to success? If it's not the sort of traditional thing that you get in the motivational books, um, how can we think about being successful in this way, but in a more sort of thoughtful or philosophical sense? So I see it in sort of three ways. Um, one way I call self maximization, the other is self minimization, and the other is duty. So self maximization means a sort of Nietzschean ideal that you imprint yourself on the universe to try and change it for the good. So you're thinking about people like Napoleon, you know, right up to Elon Musk. So it's the use of the ego to accomplish something. Um, and the understanding that it's possible to be a great egotist and also have a great positive effect. Um, Carl Jung said, in the last analysis, everything comes from the individual. That's all the great things in the world come from the individual. So that's the sort of self-maximizing way that you can justify your work in life and your path to success. And the other one, um, I see it as probably a more Eastern concept. Self-maximization is a very European, Western, American one. Self-minimization is reducing the ego so that you move and train with the universe. And in doing that, you start to see reality more clearly. You become more passionate, more wise, and the actions you take are very well considered and can benefit many people across time. So people like Lao Tzu, you know, um, the Chinese thinker, which probably exemplifies this very well, moving in tune with the Tao, you know, the way of the universe. In the West, obviously, there's a very lot of, sort of religious figures, saints, etc., which also embody it. Um, and uh, so obviously the accomplishments that come from self-minimization success are often not obvious because they can only appear in time, but they can have a huge effect. Um, so self-minimization can be a very clear choice to make as well. So you can see someone who has some big sort of conversion in life and they go from being one type of person to another. So it can be a very clear choice. And finally, the third aspect or path to success, I call duty. Now, minimizing the self is not practical if you have a sort of role to fulfill in life that's been thrust upon you and people look to you for leadership. So if you're born into a certain milieu, you take responsibility for that position, as Sartre said, um, and you do it with good faith. So a, a classic example is the Queen of England. She didn't choose her role. She probably would have been preferred to be like a farmer's wife around and animals and stuff. But, the, but she accepted the role, took it on with, with gusto. And people admire her because uh, she, she, she does represent the power of the state, but also the truth of duty. Um, that she accepted what she was about. Um, another great example is Marcus Aurelius. He said, love nothing but that which comes to you woven in the pattern of your destiny. So what could more aptly fit your needs? Um, so that's three ways of thinking about success. It's maximizing yourself, minimizing yourself, and accepting your role in life your, or your duty. So those, those ways of thinking are sort of opposite to a conventional way of um, that success is about visibility or influence or power or wealth and equating them with greatness. Actually, uh, the, the greatness, if you want to use that sort of bold word, is more likely to come from originally at least the opposite of those things. And I just want to end with a, with a thought, going back to what I originally said about success as a discipline. If it ever becomes a proper discipline, I think it can only happen through having a clear definition of success, um, perhaps like the one I suggested or another one may, may emerge. Um, but you need to go back to first principles. Um, so the success literature at the moment is very just focused on methods, strategies, etc. 
and and that's that's not enough to move the whole area forward. Um, so we need to go back to these first principles about success, what it really is, um, and look at it from a metaphysical perspective. Um, and only then can you will we be able to sort of understand uh, success properly. I could go on, but uh, just thought we'd start uh, discussing in a bit. Do you have any questions for um, Tom Shahir? Uh, yeah, well. uh, Tom, I had a quick question. I was doing some research about you the other day and I came across a video that you did about the difference between having success early on in life and then obviously having success um, like late in life, right? And you say like two to 3% of people get successful early on in life. Uh, do you think that it's a part of nature or do you think there are actually systems and strategies that you can achieve success early on in life rather than later in life? Well, um, I mean, for, for early on in life, it's all about starting very early. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, you know, Malcolm Gladwell has, has written about this a fair bit. Um, it doesn't matter what age you are, absolutely, in terms of absolute age, it's more sort of when you start. So, you know, if you, if you get 10 years of, of practice or work in some arena, if you start at seven years old or something like Tiger Woods, um, you, you have a much greater chance of becoming successful at a younger age than someone else. Certainly no guarantee, but certainly parents play a big role in this um and i guess other areas um you know in in business obviously in like uh tech and business etc some people have become very successful very very early on you know people like mark zuckerberg um and but did he plan what happened with facebook i mean definitely not it was it was an opportunity that arose and he had a certain amount of skills and he ran with the opportunity um, and that led him to success. But it's pretty hard to sort of chart a successful route when you are so young. It's easier to do it if you have a longer time frame. Um, you know, see yourself as a sort of slow cook success that you can map things out over time. So when the, when the inevitable obstacles come, um, you're okay with it because you can take it in your stride and, and keep moving forward. Sounds good. Gotcha. Um, a few, because I have a few questions lined up, so I might as well just rapid fire, right? Oh, actually, we got a question from Ben. Um, let's see what Ben is saying. All right. Ben, would you, would you like to come on and say the question or you want me to read it out loud? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Oh, Sounds so good. So what I was asking and uh, Perhaps it's, it, it might even be obvious, but are, are these three paths mutually exclusive with each other? Are there strict trade-off relations between them? Are there hybrids? How do they relate to each other? Can someone pursue one and then the other, these sorts of things? Yeah, good question. I think you could, you could pursue different ones at different times in life. Um, so a self-maximizer, it could go along that path and realize it didn't get them where they wanted and um, it actually caused more trouble or pain. So they might move on to the path of self-minimization, you know, like the businessman who goes off to an ashram or something. Um, so that is possible. I don't think you could, you could do them at the same time with the, with the exception of the self-minimization and duty. There is some similarity between them, definitely. But the, the, the duty one sort of involves a bit more, you know, ego. Um, so it's a combination of accepting your role in life and then actively going after it and pursuing it. So of the three, I think the, the duty and the minimization are, are closest, but self, the self-maximization and the minimization are sort of uh, mutually exclusive at the same time. So if, if I could ask a follow-up on this, it would be better to move on. Um, I would wonder, are there any ways that uh, 
I mean, what can be said about which way may be preferable uh, to the extent that they are exclusive? Yeah, um, th that's interesting because um, sometimes when I've, I've given talks and stuff, um, people have said, uh, well, I'm not sure if my, if my goals or my ambitions are sort of honorable enough like I'm too shallow I just want to have a I just want to um have like a BMW in in two years time or <laughs> but I think is that that's all right because the the main thing is that humans are like practicing species or always trying to improve themselves so in the early stages uh, of any life pursuing any goal is good because it makes you work on yourself um and sort of work towards things and if you if you achieve that near-term goal you know then great then you might move on to sort of higher goals you know like maslow's hierarchy of needs so that's one way to look at it another way is that everyone is different depends on your personality i mean some people come out of the womb and they're sort of on this higher spiritual level and they just want to advance humanity from an early age so but that they're sort of you know rare most people just want to achieve some sort of material or career success um you know that's probably 90 percent of people so that that's the sort of normal path so, and if we're if we're on that path then we should be happy with it thanks for that um I hesitate to ask another follow-up question, but it, it dovetails so well, I think, actually, uh, that um, if success is something that's re revealed over time, as you've said, and uh, the rippling ramifications and effects. And um, I'm just wondering how that, uh, when you're thinking about trajectories and being in the midst of, of doing things uh, and, um, making decisions about, well, since you, you only are ever in that moment, how does that the circle get squared? Uh, I hope that's clear enough. Um, as in, how, how do you cope with your presence when you have certain goals in the future that you're yet to achieve? I guess if you're, if you're Van Gogh or, uh, or something, right? If, yeah um, like could someone make the argument maybe maybe i if i'm van gogh i should just do something that would make me happy in my life and, mm. and why why does the the future far off matter to me yeah yeah i mean that's the old argument of process versus outcome i mean in hindu philosophy is a lot to say about it um and so does so does modern psychology that you you to achieve anything you have to focus on the on the moment what you're doing in the moment like if I've got a book to write, if I think about the end game, it just seems impossible. It's like I'm at the bottom of the mountain and it's I'm never going to get to the top. If you break every day into like day tight compartments and just enjoy and focus on what you are doing uh, in the moment, you win in two ways. One is you are, you are enjoying your day to day activity. And the other is that by thinking about the process and the moment, you have greater focus and concentration so the work that comes out of that focus it tends to be much better work so the outcome is is higher quality so for someone like van gogh um yeah i mean that's a that's a tricky question um if he could go back in time i guess if you could bring him back from the dead would you ask him would you change anything you know would you have given up your career as an artist and become gone into insurance or something and i'm sure he'd say despite all my misery and mental health being an artist um and what happened you know that i wouldn't have exchanged it for anything because creating my art was my truth and i believe that i was creating truth that was my success um so that's one way to look at this conundrum about matching up success in time and being very aware sometimes that what you are wanting or imagining hasn't appeared in reality. 
Love it. Just speaking to that. All right, Praneet, would you want to unmute? Praneet? Hey. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so my question is basically, I recently have been thinking about this a lot and destiny seems like a thing that I'm more comfortable and more peaceful pursuing. But when I try to explain this to uh, some of my friends or anybody who is stuck in uh, sort of like an inaction due to high amounts of ego, uh, uh, often I question myself like whether it's just a mental model that we adopt to feel better or is something like that from a universal perspective real? If so, how do we choose between going with the flow versus trying to influence things? I just wanted to hear your views on that. Yeah, that's a great question. I've thought about it a lot. Um, it's sort of uh, the, the one, way, one way to, to uh, see it, or it's been described, is like the, there's river people and then there's like mountain people and the river people would just throw themselves into the river and right. um, see where life takes them and often can take you to very good places. And the mountain one is, you know, you, you map out what you're going to do and take steps, et cetera, to, to make it there. And if you interview some very successful people, there's a blend. Like some people just think, you know, how did you achieve all this in your career? And they say, well, I just pursued stuff that was interesting to me and one thing led to another and here I am. And other people, it's just been sh through sheer grit um, and planning um, and, and, and that's where they, where they got to. Um, but I think in, if, we're, if we're trying to think about our own um, success, yeah, you can be lucky in terms of that river model going with the flow and process. Um, but we've probably all known many people who are so go with the flow that um, they sort of drift along and nothing ever really gets done. Um, and they have dreams that are not achieved, et cetera. So I would take the river people's statements about their success with a grain of salt. I think if you, are, if you want to ensure yourself for success, you need to have a fair amount of, of the mountain model and the planning. So that even if you take steps, clear steps, have goals, et cetera, and they don't necessarily lead you where you want to go, um, you can always change. If you achieve those things, then you, then you move on to something else or another opportunity um, arises. Um, but yeah, it's one of the great questions of the whole success genre that I want to do more work on because I've been very aware of it myself. It's this sort of riddle. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, I, what I take away is like, it's more of a balance thing. Uh, you try to plan, have strategies and things, try to influence it, but also be like open to uh, signs that you feel uh, from a metaphysical perspective that uh, things are uh, kind of like speaking to your soul spirit or whatever you want to call but you still go with the plan and the strategic approach yeah yeah i mean I, I love books like the alchemist by paulo coelho which is like yeah. you know his, his story of of watching the the omens and following them and and seeing where it where it takes you um so yeah i subscribe to that i mean i definitely think in a lot of studies of success, successful people, what is really always underestimated is, is uh, intuition. Um, yeah. if, you see, if you see interviews with very successful people, what they say made them successful is often not the truth. If you drill down to their key decisions in life, um, there's a fair amount of you know, rational analysis or whatever, but nearly always they say, this opportunity appeared and I just thought, they thought this is so obvious the way to go. You know, it's just, there's nothing holding me back. Let's, even if other people thought they were crazy, it seemed obvious to them. So I, I would always say you should do what seems obvious to you. Um, 
e even if other people do think it's mad, um, if you have this strong intuition, um, it's usually pretty infallible. Um, I mean, you, you can get sort of caught up with, with looking for omens and stuff. Um, it can become a bit too sort of spiritual and you can sort of go overboard with it. But I think just trusting your, your intuition um, in terms of your career path, it, it's hard to go wrong. Ryan, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, Tom, thanks. Um, you kind of just touched upon uh, my question, but I'm, I'm curious to hear a little more of what your personal definition of success has been and really how you derived that from first principle metaphysics that you've stated. Um, and then maybe kind of like how does intuition play a role in your definition of success as you see it? Yeah, I mean, I, my definition of success about success as truth has been like a long time coming <laughs> because I think I've, I've probably gone after various what I thought was success and might've been dead ends or, um, and I also had huge, um, I've also had huge sort of mental blocks and been blindsided by things that I hadn't thought I should have worried about to be successful, you know, maybe in the areas of relationships say. So I was too one tracked on career and then forgot about other aspects um, of my life. Um, so I think you do need to seem to obvious to say it, but have a have a holistic view um, of it. Uh, so I think my own approach to success, um, it's been I started off in like a regular career, um, like advising, government advising, etc. And um, it was very interesting work. I learned a lot. I learned how to summarize issues, etc. It's quite an exciting role, but I didn't feel it was right for me, like on a long term basis. So I, that was like strong intuition to me. That I thought, even if I'm good at this work, I don't want to do it forever. Um, but I wasn't, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. And then after I took a year out, did some studies, I got more and more into like the personal development literature and the area. And, you know, that just hit me with a force. And I just thought, I want to do something in this area. I don't know what, but it fascinates me. So that led me to the, to the, um, to researching personal development books and then and writing about them in the end. Uh, so it, it sort of turned into a career. So the career I'd imagined of being like a top government advisor to like to the prime minister never happened. Um, but was I unpleased about it? Definitely not. Because it led me to, to a career that was much more me, personally suited to me. You know, or anyone could have done that other job, but only I could have done what I'm doing now. Um, so... I don't know. Yeah, I think if you just have personal epiphanies like that, you know, don't don't um, discount them. Um, go with them, even if it means shaking up your life a bit or having to change career. You don't have to do it gr dramatically, um, but you know, like I had, it took me several years to go from being the career I had to being an author, financially, you know, writing the books, etc. But um, I would, I think I would have been very unhappy if I'd stayed in my original career. I don't know if that answers your question. Claudia. Hey, Claudia. You want to I, just, I just, just want to check if uh, Ryan had any follow up uh, with that. Yeah. Not necessarily a follow up, just a thanks. I really like that kind of pointing towards anyone can do this job, only I can do that job, or that's where my interest is. Is that's where the daemon, as Peter likes to say, is is the daemon, to look. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that idea of the daemon. Um, yeah, read a couple of good books on it. Uh, I think it goes back to stoicism as well a bit. 
that, that idea there's there's some sort of genie in you yeah pushing you along a sort of give it like hidden hands appear i definitely felt that like when you go on the path that's really designed for you somehow you feel like there's, there's sort of a wind behind you pushing you along even if it's materially it's difficult you still feel that um yeah this is sort of the, the direction that you're meant to be going in if i could uh, jump in with a question regarding the daemon because anyone at the store i know that is like blab about this thing 24 7 uh, um and you know how the in the stores they talk about um being virtuous affords one to be have uh, eudaimonia which a lot of moderns talk about happiness but it's like being in right relationship with the daemon um and do you have any personal heuristics uh, success heuristics uh in order to navigate that spirit that energy feel into the contours of it and be in right relationship with it um yeah in terms of heuristics i think spending being willing to spend some time alone or time out is very important um yeah i mean i think if you look at a lot of the remarkable people in history a commonality i saw kept on coming up is the sort of wilderness period um you know, where they just spent uh, a year, two years, three years, several years, people like Sigmund Freud, he called it digging in the mud, where all he did was to see his um, clients, just did research, looked into mythology. He wasn't expecting to sort of revolutionize or create a new discipline. Um, he was just focused on what he was interested in and deep thought about it as well. Uh, a lot of sort of key religious figures in history also did the same thing. Sometimes it can be, it can appear to be a sort of confusing period where what people are seeing you as it looks like you're going nowhere or drifting, but actually it's a time of very deep thought um, about thinking about the issues you're interested in and also what role you can play within that. So I think a, a, a heuristic is do take time out if you need it. And also don't be impatient with yourself. So, you know, if, there, if this daemon does exist, it will make itself heard and, um, and you need to, to listen to it. So don't, don't be thinking, I should have achieved this by a certain point. Because if you're in that wilderness period or that digging in the mud, it takes as long as it takes. You don't know how long it will go on for, um, but you just have to let it play out. And then it, things will start to coalesce and become clearer. And then suddenly you'll, you'll know what to do next. Yeah, the, what I got from that is like some of those um, like almost dead scripts that we have about success uh, that like cause shame if we don't meet them. And then that, that if you follow that spirit, almost like it, it sheds it, sheds those scripts if you can follow it correctly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the lot of these scripts that we, of course, are given us by other people or society, can also come from our own partners, which is you know very difficult. Um, but uh, rewriting your own script or letting it come into come into being um, is off is can be a difficult process, but. Um, uh, an exciting one as well because you feel like you are finally becoming you know who you're meant to be quick follow-up on peter's question now you mentioned how you do need to be patient in order to achieve success but if you're if you're constantly going towards success and working hard towards it right and if you're not achieving it or like you're not getting the results right away and you're telling yourself to be patient with it now is the right approach to accept it like oh that's reality right that oh i'm not going to get it in that time frame or should you take a different approach of like i just need to keep working towards it until i do achieve results because whichever reality you accept that essentially becomes you right so does that make sense yeah um no it's hard it's the, this gap between the reality and what you're doing now is 
um, is super hard. Um, I think people who are blessed with strong self-belief, you know, it's incredible blessing. Um, Cause you, if you look at many of the people in, in history, um, there's a book, there's a recent book actually by Richard Koch on, on principles of success. And he puts this self-belief thing as like number one, like this sense of destiny. Um, you know, people like Winston Churchill had it in spades um, that even when he was like a MP, that was sort of relatively unknown. He still believed that he was like the person who would end up being the one that sort of saved Europe. He didn't really even know how that would happen. He just sort of had this sense. So that's a very important thing. But if you, most people don't have it that much um, and it is difficult. Um, you know, I, I know authors who are trying to um, become um, best-selling authors, et cetera. And they've got sales of, you know, a few hundred copies of their books, et cetera. And it's very um, disheartening. Um, so you have to admit sometimes that you are on the wrong path if you're doing it for years and years and it doesn't come to anything you do need to be open to you know feedback from the environment you know that something has hasn't worked so you, I think the key here is that you need to be absolutely focused on being successful but you need to be open as to actual the route to get there. Um, Peter Drucker, the great management theorist, had this phrase, the unexpected success. And he looked at a lot of companies that did incredibly well because their managers were open-minded enough to see that some little piece of their business or product was suddenly doing very well, even though they hadn't expected it to. And it wasn't even part of their main product lineup. But they're open enough to expand that product or that service and let it become their main business. So I think with your with the personal success, you still need to experiment a fair bit. Keep pushing, 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 but be open to some chance encounter or aspect of what you're doing that suddenly resonates with people that you didn't expect. And you should really go forward with, with whatever resonates with other people. Otherwise, you just become a person on your own in a room or pushing a wheelbarrow up, up a hill for the rest of your life. You know, one track mind. So success is a blend of being strong ambition and desire to be successful, but being open to change, um, you know, depending on what unexpectedly resonates. Thanks, Tom. Emma, would you like to unmute yourself? Emma, are you there? Okay, we'll move on. Gordon, Gordon Young. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, You're here. Sweet. Um, uh, yeah, Tom, thanks for uh, running through all of this stuff with us. Um, one of the things I wanted to, that, that just came up in my mind is that, you know, along my journey, I've uh, spent a fair amount of time listening to Tim Ferriss' podcast as he's uh, deconstructing the things that successful people do. And obviously, uh, you know, you're having some expertise in the field um, and, and looking at a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of authors and, and perspective on this. Uh, I wonder if you have any comments or um, perspective to offer on, on Tim's approach of interviewing specific people and trying to extract the, uh, you know, extract their recipes, so to speak, um, and, and comparing and contrasting them, or anything else you might like to say about Tim Ferriss or the, you know, the sort of success, uh, um, success marketplace in general. Yeah. Um... Yeah, no, I, I love what he's doing. Um, uh, drilling down into get the success secrets of individuals um, is a fascinating early research work. It's like primary research. Um, the key will be, I mean, I know he's doing it already to some extent, but if he can turn all this research into sort of 
a, a system that can be tested by other people in like a Karl Popper sense or falsified, mm -hmm. um, I think that will be the real um, move forward. Because I think if success, talking about the whole space, if success is to become a discipline, all the contentions or theories in it need to be um, disprovable or falsified. So that's the difficulty with social sciences is that it's, it's hard to do that, you know, particularly like psychology, philosophy, obviously. The, the, the other sciences, it's easier to do. But still, I don't think we should shy away from that. Um, so, you know, if some psychologist comes out saying that, you know, grit, for example, is the key to success. People have more grit than others um, do better, or people have more self-esteem, or people who had a better upbringing, or people who had a worse upbringing. Um, you know, you can look at any number of factors, but until someone sort of puts all these data points together, or tracking thousands of people, and measures it and then turns it into a into a theory and then tries to disprove it i think we're still sort of treading water because some of the people that you know ferris interviews they have amazing points and you can try them out in your own life but you know that person had a different background or circumstances to you maybe they lived in a different time um, and have different advantages so all these, all these sort of multiple um, factors are involved in success. Um, it's a very, it, it's an area of, of huge complexity, like the weather. You know, <laughs> for mm. centuries, no one had these rules of thumb and people had some like sayings about what would happen on the next week if there was a certain cloud formation, etc. But it took us centuries and centuries and huge computer power to actually start to predict the weather well. So I think we're at a pretty early stage in the study of success, you know, despite all the millions of motivational books and speakers. Um, so I, I definitely applaud what he's doing. Um, I just think it's sort of quite early stage stuff. So do you think that for individuals, um, and to some degree, I guess you answered the question already that, uh, you know, there's variances, there's uh, people have their, their nuggets of wisdom to offer, but they may not apply in, in, uh, in your life. Um, are you, in, in your survey of the literature, um, uh, what, um, you know, have you come up with universalities that, um, in, that, that you would uh, put forth for for a general group of individuals, or would you say instead that uh, you would need to to take a look at individual circumstances in order to to discern what advice to give somebody? Yeah, I mean, I think there are there are rules of thumb um, and good strategies and tips. Um, you know, like like setting goals and moving towards them, etc. Um, understanding psychology understanding yourself, understanding habits, um, the micro aspects of success. There's been a lot of work in that area. Um, so all of those are generic things that you can apply to yourself and you will probably do pretty, pretty well by following them. Um, so yeah, I think that, that, is, that is a given, but it still doesn't totally um, explain if you have two very similar people say why one person ends up being in conventional terms you know very successful and the other person that had all the similar advantages etc um, does not so I'm going to get a bit metaphysical here and I and say that success is not only down to advantages and active um, being proactive, having strategies, goals, there is some element of karma or fate involved. So some people just come into the life, into life almost like they come out and they're ready to go. They've got a mission, they know what they're going to do, and they achieve it. 
etc. It's almost like they've had so many previous existences, they couldn't wait for this one. They knew exactly what they were going to do, they had the right circumstances, everything was set up perfectly for them, and they did it. Whereas another person, you know, all the opposite can apply and, and life is a struggle. And, or, and then again, someone else can have very good circumstances. And then, um, you know, like the Enron guy, can't remember his name, went to Harvard and everything. And through personal greed or whatever, throws it all away. So I would say, you know, 90% of it is just work on yourself and what you can do. But um, there is still this sort of element of the, of the daemon of fate, of karma that certainly plays a role and that, you know, we'll never be able to, to fully explain. Yeah. Thank you. I just, uh, um, as Kevin was saying in the chats, the degree of success seems like it rests on the degree of contextual intelligence, which I thought, it, I think you just said the same thing and or, or very, uh, you know, the, the, the things tie together very much with what you were just saying. So I just was mm -hmm. highlighting, you know, that, that struck me. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Good questions. Sounds good. Claudia had a question. I'm going to read it out loud. Um, there is a mixed feeling towards the ego with the common belief that the ego can be an unhealthy belief in our own importance, self-centered ambition. How does one affect those pursuing success through the use of ego? Is there some sort of balance in that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I sort of, talking about it a bit before in relation to that self-maximizing model. There is a sort of, it has come to be a belief that there's something bad about the ego. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in our culture. And um, I think that is wrong um, because most people are not going to become like meditators or, you know, um, types who who minimize themselves so they can think about others and be compassionate etc most of us will have come up some strong passion or interest and want to pursue it and part of it will be a um a wish to benefit others and part of it will just be for us to be successful in our life that we have a successful career which will give us money which will bring us to a good relationship which will give us status, etc. So I don't think we should be ashamed of having these these twin goals of wanting to to benefit others and also to you know achieve like personal success. Um, usually, is that if you really want to benefit others, if you're set on that, then it will lead you to to material success anyway, because by wanting to benefit others, you come up with some idea or product or success or service, um, and by creating that thing, it's valuable. So people will demand your time, you know, or what you've created. Um, so I think that's that's a good way to, to look at it, is that um, don't discount your ego or, or wanting to, to achieve success for yourself, but you could be looking at it slightly the wrong way around is that if you're thinking about, you know, benefiting the world, that would often lead, lead you anyway to what your ego wanted in the first place. You know, uh, and, and you get the status and the money, et cetera, anyway, um, but because you had a more noble intention to begin with. Thank you very much, Tom. We're coming to an end. Any final thoughts? Um, I think it's just useful to see humanity as a, a sort of planet of the practicing or the practicing species. We're always trying to go higher. You know, we're a vertical uh, type of animal. So never be afraid of, your, of wishing to go further, better, stronger, achieve more. That's how, that's how we are. Even if that ambition is to be, you know, more spiritual or, or whatever. Um, uh, it's fine. It's that, that that is our natural state of mind. So I don't think ever, don't ever be afraid of your ego or, or don't ever see success can be a sort of taboo in some circles. People don't really like to talk about it. 
Um, but if you uh, if you're not ashamed of it um, and you're quite open about what you want to achieve, you know, by by stating it out loud, people will form around you that will help you and support you, and circumstances will, and and that will push you on towards achieving it. Thank you so much, Tom, for taking the time out to actually answer these questions. I'm going to give it back to Pete. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks you here. Yeah, it was my pleasure too. Awesome. Um, I'll make some closing announcements in a moment, uh, but thank you, Shahir, for uh, jumping in. This is your very first STOA session, and I just threw you as an MC <laughs> role, and that's how we roll at the at the STOA. Um, and he's the only man in, in, in the world that calls me Pete, and that's cool. Uh, and Tom, thank you so much for uh, coming to the STOA today. Uh, we'd love to have you back and share your wisdom on all the other 50 books, because we've got this one. I read this one, 50 Success Classics, which I really recommend. Um, yeah. And I read like most of the books in here and I wish I read this one first because then I wouldn't have read those other books. <laughs> it's it's uh, a lot easier to read this one. So uh, yeah, we'd love to have you back. The first one, it's so helpful. One. Oh, cool, and then cool. Back, then I did the spiritual psychology. Yeah, it's been labor of love. Um, but yeah, it's a shortcut. If you don't want to read 50 books, just read one. And that might be a good session itself, how to read 50 books and condense it into one, you know, like <laughs> what kind of psychotechnology is that? Um, so thanks so much, Tom, for coming to STOA and uh, the upcoming events that we have. Um, let me just, we have three uh, now. We're going to have an hour break so I can have a life and eat for a bit. Uh, and then we have a ultra working session with, um, just give me one moment, copy and paste all this. Uh, Ultra working with Sebastian Marshall. That's at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Sebastian Marshall has this um, system called ultra working. If anyone did the stoic hustle here, it's pretty much that. Uh, I borrowed it from him. Uh, and then we got uh, Piers Steele, who's one of the leading scholars in procrastination. And he's going to have a trans perspectival approach to procrastination, why we do it from a philosophical lens, psychological lens, sociological lens, which is going to be really cool. And then uh, this is a juicy one. Not so secret, the law of attraction, positive thinking, and the new thought movement with uh, uh, Mitch Horowitz. Uh, he's coming at 6 p.m. Eastern time, uh, and that's going to be a, an exciting talk. So that being said, everyone, thank you for coming to the today. Hope to see you uh, in an hour.